Older people in hospitals are at risk of constipation, and the hospital nursing staffs are often understaffed and poorly managed due to incompetence, negligence, and the hospital's philosophy of putting profits before people. Failure to treat the condition can lead to increased morbidity and even death, which is exactly what happened to Dorothy Valdez at Dignity Health Mercy San Juan Hospital on April 2nd, 2012. Thanks to 20th century advances in public health and medicine, a majority of Americans now live into elderhood. Many of them need increased medical care. But remarkably, hospitals aren't designed with elders in mind. Walk through any hospital and you will almost invariably find cheerful decor for children, services and facilities aimed at adults, and a gauntlet of obstacles and insults to elders. It means a one-size-fits-all approach to both facilities and care that doesn't acknowledge that the needs, preferences, and realities of a 75 to 95-year-old patient with medical conditions might differ from those of a 35 to 55-year-old with the same thing. It's a rare industry that doesn't target and cater to its best customers. Healthcare not only fails to cater to elders, it fosters system-wide injustice by failing to apply the same standards to elderhood that it applies to childhood and adulthood. Just as children's hospitals have been shown to save and better the lives of children, hospital wards, services, and emergency departments aimed at elders improve their care and lives when compared to adult centric facilities. Dignity Health Care's Mercy San Juan Hospital in Sacramento chose not to provide the hands-on patient care and the nursing assessments necessary to address Dorothy Valdez's health and safety after she and her adult children kept complaining and pleading to the staff that their mother had been constipated for 19 days after her admittance and nobody was helping her. She died in horrible pain just 19 days after being admitted to Dignity Health. Here is Dorothy Valdez's daughter, Cynthia, to personally tell you the horrors her mother experienced at Dignity Health before she died. My mom means the world to me. She had six kids. She worked in the dry cleaners. She always worked hard, always took care of all of us. And she loved holidays. She loved Christmas. She really gave us a lot of structure. And you know, we all have great educations because she taught us that she wanted us to go to school. I'm, my viewpoint on the outcome of my mother's fate is just absolutely horrifying because nobody in this world at the end should die of a fecal impaction. And my mom was like complaining every day, you know, and I was complaining, I was down there. You know, my sister, all of us, my brother at the time, and we were complaining that she keeps saying she didn't have a bowel movement. We just didn't know that once Leslie took the case that they actually were charting bowel movements. So all the doctors were looking at the charts and they were thinking she was having it. She never was until the end. I hold responsible the CEOs, the administrators, everybody up there and the top of Dignity Health that you know, all they're doing up there is they're just trying to have as less staff as they can because that's a cost to their facilities. But these patients that are coming into their facilities are very sick patients. They're not, and their acuity is really high, and they need more nurses. And those are the ones that are the criminals, are the CEOs and the administrators who are not even looking at the pleading of the staff, especially the nursing staff, who is telling them over, hundreds and hundreds of them telling them, we don't have enough staff for them, how ill these patients are. I think how we should change this is there needs to be like new rules put in place where corporate, the corporates that own these buildings, that own these facilities, they're the ones that need to be held responsible because they're the one, I mean, we're talking someone who went 18 days and never had a bowel movement and died from fecal coming out of her mouth and no one's held responsible for that. In this insider exclusive Justice in America Network TV special, Dignity Health and Dorothy Valdez's death, we visit with Leslie Clement at the Clement Law Group as we take you inside today's legal system examining Leslie's strategies and her client's thoughts and in vivid detail showing you the often heartbreaking stories of cases like her client, Dorothy Valdez, who Leslie successfully settled for a record amount for the horrific, wrongful, and unnecessary death she experienced. 
These victims could be you or me one day. And if you are so unlucky, you will quickly find out that justice in America is a hard won battle where very few insurance companies, doctors, nurses, and hospitals ever do the right thing. And you need experienced and passionate trial lawyers like Leslie Clement, who wage these battles with their own financial resources to get their clients justice. She believes that elders within our community deserve the utmost respect and that any individual who brings harm to an elderly person should be held accountable. She uses the civil court system to ensure the rights of the elderly are protected and that their abusers are held accountable for their wrongdoing. She sees it her mission to fight for people who have been harmed by the willful or negligent actions of others. Leslie has built a substantial reputation by consistently winning cases other law firms have turned down. And her amazing courtroom skills and headline-grabbing success rate continue to provide her clients with the results they need and the results they definitely deserve. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Sacramento, California. It is my great pleasure to introduce Leslie Clement and Monica Padrazzini to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you. you. Today we're here, uh, we're going to be talking about many of the cases that you do, like nursing home deaths and all this other sort of thing. But let's talk a little bit about both of you and how you got in this business of the area of law protecting elders. In uh, 1994, I got a phone call from my Aunt Pam. and she left me a voicemail message. And I'll never forget her voice. She was trembling, she was crying, and she told me her mother, my Aunt Dorothy, was in the emergency room. And she'd been beaten up. And the doctor said it was elder abuse. And she didn't know what to do. And I'm the only one foolish enough in my family to be a lawyer. So I went down. And I saw Dorothy, and I couldn't believe it. And she had been abused in the facility. She had been a, she had been beaten up by the only caregiver in a 46-bed Alzheimer's specialty facility in Marin, very expensive facility. And she was put outside to make it appear as though she had been mugged. In the course of our investigation, my investigator found in about two hours, two other former employees who worked with the assailant in two different care facilities who had reported her, the assailant, for beating up, physically abusing other residents. And nobody did any background. Nobody reported them. They don't want anybody coming in from the state to see what they're doing. So I was a business lawyer. I'd never done anything. I'd never read a medical record before. I had no idea what I was doing, but I dug in. I learned. I talked to advocates all over the country, and I learned that nobody will take these cases at that time. And they would say to me, well, you'll take an elder abuse case. Will you help us? And that was my first case, and we tried it. And we got a great result, but it changed my life. So I left the firm I was in, left the partnership I was in, and started my own firm. It was me and a paralegal to start. And then my cousin Monica joined the firm, and she's been an invaluable part of our team for 25 years. And I understand, Monica, that not only are you a paralegal, but you do a lot of the groundwork investigation, the gumshoe work, right? Yes, that is part of my job, doing the um, investigation into complaints issued by the uh, public, uh, specifically when we take a case, our client, to the Department of Social Services, if it's assisted living, to the Department of Health, if it's a nursing home. I retrieve the files that are available to the public and do a, a thorough review of the documentation. I've found 
over the 25 years, we have had a lot more pushback from these agencies on providing us with the documentation that um, supports their investigations. In the beginning, it was forthcoming in the public file, and now we're told they don't maintain it. We have to do a FOIA request or a PRA Public Records Act request, and usually that turns into years before if we ever see the investigative. Yeah, so let's look at what's going beyond behind the scenes. If they make it difficult, the state agencies make it difficult to get information, who's behind that? Because the state agency is not being sued, right? No, they're not. They are instructing their investigators not to substantiate complaints, um, egregious complaints, complaints that result in resident deaths, but they will substantiate a minor um, hot water is not the appropriate temperature or there's, you know, an uncleanly kitchen or some type of unsanitary situation, but, you know, falls that result in fractures, um, abuse, sexual, that is typically unsubstantiated. When, um, since you do many of these type of cases, when they see you coming and again requesting additional information, What's, don't they get used to you after a while? I think they are now. No, 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 but don't they say, okay, we'll give it to you, no hassle? No, no, now it's getting more difficult. We, you know, have to go up the chain, you know, starting with the officer of the day who is by law supposed to provide you on request yeah. when you come into their agency with the file. Now you go in there and, oh, the file's not here. Um, it's locked in the, uh, you know, investigator's cabinet, things that are completely, you know, illegal. They, they need to be produced on demand. It's for the public's service to know what's in this file for a facility. One of your other clients was Dorothy Valdez, and you ended up suing Dignity Health. Tell our audience who Dorothy was first. Dorothy was a loving mother and grandmother. She was a lot of fun. She loved Christmas because she loved giving people gifts. She would surprise her kids and grandkids with little things. She loved to travel with their kids. She loved to go to Tahoe, Reno, Disneyland. She was a really good person. Now, the reason this case came about is what happened to Dorothy? Well, Dorothy went to a Dignity Hospital because her physician said, you need to go because you have shortness of breath, and that could be something very serious. She was admitted to the hospital, and over the course of 13 days, she and her children were complaining to the nursing staff that she was constipated, and she wasn't having a bowel movement. And after 13 days of Dorothy being in so much agony and pain, Finally, a nurse called in a specialist, a GI doctor. He couldn't believe that Dorothy had been in the hospital for 13 days and no one had addressed this. So let me ask you this question. You know, these facilities have people who have medical problems. They should be aware that 13 days not having a bowel movement is really dangerous. It's deadly maybe even seven days, maybe even five days, I don't know. Why wasn't a doctor called in by the, by the facility to look at her prior to this time? Well, the evidence we found was that the hospital was understaffing its nurses. When I say understaffing, I don't mean a couple of people. I mean 40% understaffed while Dorothy was there. And the way they were doing this was they were violating the safe patient staffing laws. And let's tell our audience what that means and what it is. Well, the, the California Nursing Association fought for years to get safe patient loads for each of their nurses. And so after years of fighting in the legislature, they finally got a law that says, okay, Every unit in the hospital has to track patient acuity in real time. You're going to have a ratio. In the intensive care unit, no nurse can have more than two patients. 
on the cardiac unit where Dorothy was, no nurse can have more than four patients. That ratio is the floor. The law says, hospital, you've got to track how much work it's going to take for each of your nurses to meet the patient's needs. By the way, how do they track it? Do they track it electronically, or does somebody do it the old-fashioned way, writing into some record that nobody sees? Well, the nurses are given a document with little numbers on it, and they're supposed to write there how many times on a shift they had to do this particular task with their patient. But it doesn't show the nurses how many minutes of time that takes. They submit that document where it's put into Dignity's own system where they create a percentage of staffing for the building. But what we found was that Dignity was counting staff who were not direct caregivers. The ward clerk, who's basically someone sitting at the desk, they're not a health care provider, they're answering phones, they're sending faxes. All their time was added. They were also including the time of techs who sit in a completely different place in the hospital and they're monitoring the, the telemetry monitors that are showing if someone is having a bad heart rate, their heart's slowing, and they call Nurse Jackson, your patient in the labor and delivery, her, her monitor's going off, you need to check on her. They were adding all of that time to the, to the staffing. In addition, they were adding all of the break time that the nurses were taking and were required to take under the law. So this skewed the numbers. And when the nurses would complain that they were understaffed, Digny would come out and say, hey, look at our graph. We're at 103%, we're at 104%, we're overstaffed. And it went further than that. The nurses could complain about their patient load via a document called Assignment Despite Objection. And the nurse only fills this document out if she believes that the health and safety of her patients are threatened. She writes out what the circumstances are, the date, and she has to call the manager and tell the manager, the nursing manager, what is going on and why she needs more help. It took us almost two years to get those documents out of dignity. And when we finally did, we found for this one hospital, over 300 nurses had submitted these documents, these warning signals to dignity in a single year. There were nearly a thousand of these documents. And they, the nurses, not only do they tell the manager what happens, they write down the manager's response. These responses included, I hope you have to work any, even harder. Everybody's short-staffed. It's Easter. Let me ask you this. When you discover this evidence, obviously, do you also submit this to regulatory agencies? Try. Try. What does that mean? In this case, the... Department of Public Health said there was enough staff because all they did was talk to the nurse managers. They didn't look at any records. They weren't interested. But who I did take the evidence to was the California Nurses Association. And they were very surprised at what was going on. Yeah, and when you mentioned they fought to get this, they're fighting against who? They're trying to get the attentions of legislators to pass statutes, legislation, to protect patients, residents. But when they're fighting, they're actually their, their enemy, if you will, is the lobbyists or the legislators who are being paid by the nursing home and assisted living and hospitals right, to make sure that more regulation isn't passed to defeat or decrease the profit that they make in their operations, right? Absolutely, 100%. And they have the most powerful lobby. 
in California. I mean, there was no one more powerful than the health industry lobby. Yeah, what happened in this case? Uh, Dorothy was seen by a GI doctor, and he could not believe that no one had called him for 13 days. Her colon was so impacted, correct? It was like a brick. And she was so old that surgery was ruled out, right? They didn't think surgery would be successful, that she would die on the table in the operating room. So they basically said sayonara, right? They told the family she needs to go on comfort care. And then they didn't keep her comfortable. For the last five days of her life, she had excruciating pain that they documented as high as 10 out of 10, which would you read that definition of that? It means it is like having your hand crushed. They didn't, the last two days she was there, they just stopped even recording her pain while her two daughters, her two daughters were there 24 seven. Their mother was aspirating feces. No aspirating feces. Backing up into her mouth. And her two daughters were suctioning this out and washing her mouth, giving her ice chips, holding her hand. I've never had a case against a hospital that was so disgusting, that was so undignified. And here it was done by Dignity Health. A well-known name. The largest hospital chain in California and growing. What was the final outcome of the case? Immediately before trial, we had a mediation at their request, attended by Top Brass. And they settled the case. So do they say to you in these mediations, we don't want this? Do they actually say, we don't want this public? They try to write into the settlement agreement yeah. that no one can talk about what happened. And my clients always refuse. You can't hide elder abuse from the public. It needs to be known. There needs to be a record, a public record of what these defendants are doing. Now, I know that this is settled confidentially in terms of the amount of money, okay? Um, but it was settled after how many years of gathering evidence, how many years of obstruction and obstructing um, the, the flow of documents from the other side? How long did that take? They withheld evidence and prevented us from preparing for trial for nearly three years. And it took multiple court orders, more than a dozen court orders to get compliance and produce records. In fact, it wasn't until I met with the California Nurses Association and told them, oh, we've got about 300 of these assignment despite objections now. And the Nursing Association told me 300, there are thousands. Wow, that's amazing. And I'll tell you what else. The chief nurse executive of that hospital in deposition testified she's never looked at these documents. She's never looked at what her nurses have been saying for years, that the health and safety of their patients is threatened. Your follow-up question would have been, why not? It was. What was her answer? I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> What's your job? <laughs> well, according to the CEO of the hospital, that was her job. Fortunately, we have Dorothy's uh, daughter here. We're going to bring her on right now. Her name is Cynthia Baker. So let's bring her on right now. It is my great pleasure to introduce Cynthia Baker to the show. Welcome to the show, Cynthia. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for coming on the show. It must have been a very painful experience. It was. To watch your mother die right in front of your eyes. Yeah, it was very painful. What did you see happening or not happening at the hospital that should have been happening? And what were you trying to do to make sure that your mom was cared for? Well, while I was there a lot of times because I was helping her with her baths because she called me at work one day and said that they just give me a basin and water and a rag, but I can't clean myself as well. So when I get off work, I'd go over there and I would help her with a bath. I'd walk her and she'd say, babe, I haven't had a bowel movement. So I'd go up to the nurse and I would ask her, I say, hey, my mom's complaining she hasn't had a bowel movement. I mean, can you give her something? And um, I asked, can I talk to the doctor? And they um, 
said, oh, we'll get with the doctor, we'll look at our orders. And I think they were giving her like cool ace. And then um, days kept going by and, and then one day I went in there and she said, babe, they charted a bowel movement but I only had three marbles. And I said, hey, my mom knows her body. She said she hasn't had a bowel movement. Is there anything you can do? Can I talk to the doctor? And they didn't, you know, get the doctor at all. And, you know, there in the hospital, it was hospitalist. So, I, and I always went in the aft. I got off work at 3.30, so I was aft of this back. So because of that, the doctors weren't really around. They weren't doing rounds or anything. So she just kept getting worse, kept getting worse. Well, one day, you know, I, then I went home and called my sister. And I said, you know, we're going to have to go down there. And one day, the pulmonologist and the hospitalist comes in because they're thinking she's going home that day. And... She's distended, she's writhing in pain, and they tell her, you know, we, we think you have a fecal impaction. And I remember her going, I'm not ready to die. Don't, I don't want to die. I don't want to leave my kids. And it was very traumatic to us. And I remember my sister whispering to me, you know, we thought my mom might have died of shortness of breath or something, but not a fecal impaction. So as the days went by, she, um, she just started where they put an NG tube down, but towards the end, and she had moved, they had a general surgeon come in, but they didn't think she was a surgical candidate. So they just told her to move around. And no matter how much she was in pain, they would sit her up in the chair. She would sit up in a chair. She was moving. She was trying to do everything she could because she didn't want to die. And she was angry. And then one day I was sitting next to her. And, well, then they called in the GI specialist, like Leslie said. And, of course, by then it was 13 days. Well, you know, as a a sibling, you know, you're more focused on your mom's health. And even though we were complaining every day about her not having a bowel movement, lost track of time on ourselves. Then what happened was when they finally realized there was nothing more we can do, another GI specialist came in and he goes, did you go yet? And she was sitting up in bed and he said, um, and she said, no, he goes, well, your bowel's rotten. And he says, there's nothing we can do. And I remember looking at my mom with a blank stare. And she just looked at me and she goes, babe, is there anything you can do so this doesn't happen to another family member? Please do it. And I said, mom, I'll do the best job I can. And then from there, she had an NG tube. Well, towards the end, when they put her on comfort care, because she was in just so much pain, you know, we could, I can't imagine not having a bowel movement for the many days. So then they put an NG tube in her, but she had feces coming out of her mouth. And there was hardly any staff coming in. And by then, my sister and I were like suctioning her out. We put how her just have ice and then spit the water out to rinse out her mouth shaking the bed rails, panic because she was choking, sitting her up, you know, and until... Well, how come and no doctor came around or nurse while this is going on? They, I, I, I felt like when it got down to the end, nobody wanted to be involved anymore. How could she breathe at the same time? It was hard. She was, you know, constantly choking. We were keeping her set up. We'd get the nurse. They might come in briefly, but, you know, by the time they realized what happened, it was like nobody really wanted to, to be there. It was like nobody wanted to be involved anymore because they knew that this should have never happened. You know, and she was in an acute care hospital and she was in there for 13 days before they even realized that that's where she was at. And before that, she would be walking and stuff, but my mom was always stoic with pain. And then what happened, was, and then she just got to where she couldn't take it anymore. And, you know, so we finally put her on comfort care and I remember you know we all told her how much we loved her and then when they gave her the med to put her to sleep I remember going oh no but no parent should die angry and my mom died angry and she died of something she should have never died of. Did you ever find out what if anything they were giving her to help her out? The only thing I really heard of was like Colace you know but I but as far as the other meds I think Ativan but I don't know you know, I don't know. I was focused on my mom. Our audience watches this and they're thinking, you know, something's wrong here. If I was in, you know, your position, I think something's wrong. You were thinking that too. Your mom passed away. And my condolences to you for that. Um, but then you're thinking, I need this investigated, right? Because you want to find out what really happened. How did you end up with Leslie? Well, where I worked at, one of the uh, nurses was uh, used to work at a nursing home, and she was the dean of nurses. And she knew of Carol Herman. 
Um, so she said, let me give you her number because she says, I know she has a really good lawyer. And she says, I can't remember her name at the time. So I called Carol Herman and I told her what happened. And actually my sister and my brother and I went and met with her and I told her what happened and she goes on the phone and she says, well, I'm going to shoot an email over to the lawyer that's on my board. Her name is Leslie Clements and I'm going to shoot an email over to her. No lie, nine o'clock the next morning, Monica was calling me and we already ordered mom's chart, you know, and they just said, when you get the chart, bring it in. And then we met Monica first and then that, and then that's how it all worked. By that, that time, we met with uh, um, Leslie in July. I would imagine, Leslie, that you had never seen a case like this before. I had never seen a case in an acute care hospital where someone went in with shortness of breath and 18 days later, they died of something that is so common. I mean, it should be checked every time a nurse comes in the room. In fact, Dignity had a policy that whenever they came into the room, that was supposed to be one of the questions they asked. Um, I had, we had talked earlier and I was saying, how do you, you know, take the cases that you eventually, you know, try? There must be some cases that just cry out to you that you expedite your evaluation process because this is insane that this happened. It was total insanity and uh, I put together an incredible team of experts and investigators and, you know, it took us three years, but we cracked the code and we found out exactly why this happened to Dorothy. It wasn't because the nurses weren't trying, it was because there just wasn't enough of them. Cynthia, parting words to our audience here on national TV about what kids, adult children, should look for and do if they're unsure or suspicious that their parents who are in these hospitals are not being taken care of properly? What should you do immediately? I feel that as soon as you feel like the care is not being given and you get suspicious, and especially about with what is happening with my, what happened with my mother, you need to just insist, I want the doctor now. I want, or, you know, CEO, wherever you need to go, but just don't, be as trustful within the staff or within everyone because in the end something like this can happen. And uh, Leslie, you had also mentioned one of the tools of the trade, which is the trade that I'm in, is go to the media, right? Absolutely. Why should you go to the media? You should go to the media because people like Dorothy have no voice and the media can investigate and bring to light to everyone in the community what is happening in this particular hospital or this hospital chain. I'm glad you're here today and sending that message out. And I want to thank you very much for being on this. Thank you. You know, Dignity Health is a huge conglomerate and growing, as you've mentioned. How can a regular person figure out before they put their loved one in a hospital, let's say that's run by them, um, how can they determine whether it's a safe environment for their family? Well, there's not, it's not an easy way uh, to answer that because there's not any easy information. There's not consumer information available like there is for skilled nursing facilities. Uh, the the federal government is trying to create a consumer tool like that, but it really doesn't exist. Word of mouth is good. Talking to friends, talking to nurses who work there, talking to the Nurses Association, if you can, about what the worst uh, hospitals are and which ones are the best. But, you know, so many of us have health, you know, their health care is by an HMO. They're deciding which hospital which medical providers you're gonna have. That's very challenging. In Dorothy's case, if that had been your mother, what would you have done at four or five days into her constipation period? Well, I would have requested and obtained a meeting with the chief executive officer and the that's chief nurse executive. And that's what people should do. Go to the top of the food chain, man. Don't just stop with the floor nurse who has no power. 
go all the way to the top. Don't let them give you some nurse supervisor. Go all the way to the top. I want to thank you very much for being on the show, and congratulations on that settlement that you've got. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at InsiderExclusive.com.